Okay, good deal. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you guys for having me. Um, I guess I'm just going to take off because I'm, I'm definitely a person who has a lot to say. Um, and, you know, I have a lot of love for the Lord, for what he did for me. And, um, and I love sharing my, my story, which really is his story. Um, but <clears throat> first of all, Jeremiah, I want to thank you for, for, for uh, inviting me to be a part of this. Um, the opportunity to share with with men um, all over the, the country or world or whoever's going to hear this. I don't even know. Before I, I got started, I prayed and I asked the Lord to send one person that would need to hear uh, this message. And so um, so I, I, I got a lot to say and I'm just going to go ahead and, and get started. Uh, but my name is Salim Maslamani. Um, I'm from Jacksonville, Florida, and I'm a husband. I'm a father of two young boys uh, who are eight and four. I work in the medical industry as a marketing liaison. Um, very much driven and disciplined, uh, strong-willed, kind of entrepreneurial-minded mind person who loves to just spend time with my family. Um, I love leading my wife. I love leading my kids into deeper relationship with Jesus. Um, I love building others up. Uh, I love coaching my, my kids' sports teams. Um, I love serving. I love the mission field. I love evangelizing. Uh, I love sharing the gospel. Uh, and I just love the body of Christ. And I love Jesus. And I'm sold out uh, for his mission of expanding his kingdom and covering this globe with the good news. Uh, and that is me today. Um, but this wasn't always me. Um, I was born in April of, of 1980 uh, to two people uh, who were not ready to bring a child into the world. Um, my mom was, was about 20 years old or so. Uh, my dad was about uh, 27 uh, he owned a hotel in Northern Virginia and often threw big parties there. Uh, so there, that's where he met my mom. Uh, that, that, that was a heavy, a heavy night of drinking and, and just the fling happened. Um, they, they weren't married. Uh, they, they weren't thinking about marriage. Uh, they didn't even know each other. Um, they were just drunk and were physically attracted and boom. Nine months later, uh, I was born. So during that nine months, there were talks about aborting the pregnancy. Uh, there was a lot of questions. Uh, my dad, he just wasn't ready. I mean, his background as a child, just to kind of give you an idea, was this. He, he grew up in poverty in Palestine. Uh, he was illiterate. Uh, and his dad was a very abusive person, was pretty much a tyrant. Um, when I say tyrant, I mean, he was psychotic. I mean, he, he beat the children uh, he beat my grandmother to a pulp, um, which was was even worse. Uh, he was um, just super dysfunctional. And bottom line is this, there was zero leadership in this home. And my dad, he had no idea what he was doing. So here he was in the U.S., you know, just trying to chase the American dream. And, and I was a roadblock. And so by the grace of God, I was born, but born into brokenness. Um, born into despair, born into a, a pretty much a hopeless future. And so my mom was a drunk, had no idea what a mother should be. She had another son um, by a different man. Her childhood was an absolute disaster as well. She, she had already been raped um, as a young teenager. So there was just a lot of scars. Um, her mom was an alcoholic. There was 12 children in his family, mostly by different fathers. Um, so you all use your imagination and you see what kind of environment um, I had been born into. So during my childhood years, I was passed around a lot from uncle to uncle, uh, from mom to dad. Uh, my dad eventually got custody uh, of me uh, because of this, the terrible environment my mom was raising me in. So, you know, it, it was different men every night. Uh, it was drugs. It was alcohol abuse. It was physical altercations. It was social services um, coming in and out uh, weekly. Um, there was no oversight. Uh, I was getting into trouble uh, for shoplifting at a young age. Uh, my mom moved every six months, and so there was no stability. Uh, we lived in really bad neighborhoods where I was the minority. Um, she ended up having two more children by two different men. So here she had four kids by four different men. And during these years, till I was about 10, I sort of went back and forth from mom to dad uh, via the Greyhound bus. And so I don't even know if people still ride Greyhound buses, but have you ever been to a Greyhound bus station? I mean, wow. I mean, as, as the helicopter dad that I am, I'm having anxiety just thinking about dropping off my six or seven year old uh, at, at, a, at a Greyhound bus station. But 
anyway, so it would be the age of 10 that my dad would come and get me. And this would be about the last time I saw my mom. And so he picked me up. Uh, he decided that he decided to take me home to his house full time. Uh, he had gotten his life together a little. He had settled down. He had, he had finally gotten married. Uh, there was another child in the picture who at this point was a toddler. So I left and, and never looked back. And my mom ended up moving to upstate New York. And this would be the last time I saw her, as I mentioned before. So I moved in with my dad. And at first it was good. I mean, it was, it was very different uh, from the standpoint of stability, uh, some, some normalcy. Uh, there was some family structure. Um, but the honeymoon phase quickly, it quickly wore off. And uh, my stepmom began treating me, I would say, unfairly. Uh, the verbal abuse began, uh, the ugly words, you know, constantly being thrown my way. You won't amount to S-H-I-T. Uh, you're, you're lazy. Uh, you're in the way. Um, so it truly was a feeling that I was the outcast and I was not wanted. And so I can remember being made, just to give you a few things, to sleep in a section of the house where we had no heat. And I was just given an electric blanket and, and to stay warm at night. I can remember being sent to school with no lunch money. I mean, throughout my entire middle school and high school career, um, I would ride the bus while my brother, you know, got a ride to school. And I'm not against riding the bus. Riding the bus is good. But I always wondered, why, why can't I get a ride? Like, well, <laughs> why, why are you putting me on the bus and you're taking him? I had to provide my own school clothes at a very young age. I mean, Christmases were bare. Birthdays were nothing. Um, there was never acknowledgement. And I was made to feel... Um, like I wasn't wanted and, and the hate from my stepmother was absolutely evident. And so you're probably wondering, well, what was my dad saying about all of this? Nothing. And he was quiet. I mean, he was catering to her and allowing her to pretty much dominate. And I can remember calling my mom in upstate New York, and I'll never forget this time and begging her, crying. I mean, literally weeping, wailing to her to let me come and live at her house because I wanted to get out of this environment. And you know what she said? She said, no. And I'll never forget that. I never forget walking away from that conversation and feeling like, okay, I'm, I have, I'm, I'm against the wall. I have nowhere to go. I'm 14 years old. I've got to get to 18 so I can get the heck out of here. Right? So at this point I felt a rejection that was absolutely leading me uh, to the wrong place, to a place of anger, a place of fear, a, de a place of depression. Uh, and so I, I sought out anything that would make me feel better, uh, to feel wanted, I mean, to feel worthwhile. So I began spending all my weekends as a teenager at, at friend's house. I began drinking heavy. Uh, I began smoking weed. And, and this was my lifestyle for my high school years, early on. I mean, eighth grade all the way up to, 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 to senior year. And so my home life was non-existent. My relationship with my family was absolutely volatile. It was very broken and there was, there was no love in this home. This environment truly produced uh, a young man who was absolutely angry. Uh, and when I say angry, it was another level of anger. And I think I took the gene from my grandfather. I mean, when you talk about a temper, it, it was a violent temper. Um, I was hot tempered to say the least. Uh, I was verbally abusive to girlfriends. Uh, I was not faithful. I would cheat in a heartbeat. Um, I had no idea what healthy relationships really were. I, I was insecure. I was anxious and fearful. I lacked confidence. Um, I lacked commitment because all, all that was modeled for me was lackluster parenting or no parenting at all. And so at 18, I grew up and I left and I was like, I was on my own at this point. And, and for the sake of time, I want to get through to the end of this testimony because there's more I want to speak about. Uh, but for those interested in more details for the full story, just go to brokenandchosen.com. I have my story there and you can read it. Um, hold on one second, guys. Sorry, is that better? Okay. Am I good, Jeremiah? Okay, great. So, so anyway, so I got out of high school. And I went off to college and I never looked back. I was on my own. I began hustling drugs. I began experimenting with harder drugs. I was partying. It was, it was girls. It, it was drugs. It was alcohol. It was the clothes. It was everything that made me feel good. And it all covered up my insecurities. 
I was making money. I had friends. I felt good about myself, uh, but it was all a facade. I mean, it was, it was absolutely all a shell. And it, deep down, I was, I was empty. I was lost. I was depressed. I feared failure. I feared death. I had all of these things that I thought brought me life, but actually did nothing but put a Band-Aid on the real issues. So my senior year, uh, I ended up college. I ended up meeting my, my current my wife, Jackie, and we met on a blind date. And I was so impressed with her. I, she came from a radically different background. I mean, army brat, parents were still together, uh, grew up in the church, a lukewarm Christian home, but still she had somewhat of a foundation. And so when we met, we just partied together. Uh, we had a lot of fun. We, we lived in sin. We ended up moving to Jacksonville uh, after we graduated in May of 2005. And by this time, it was absolutely just a new start for both of us. I mean, we had settled down, we got an apartment together, and we just began in the real world. And so at this point, I'd gotten my life somewhat straight. I'd stopped getting high. I'd stopped drinking all the time and limited it to, you know, to weekends and you know, get-togethers and, and weddings and things like that. And so we had somewhat of a normal, normal life together. Um, we, we found a local church and thought that the label of being a churchgoer would, uh, would be a good thing. Uh, so that lasted about two and a half weeks. And then we gave that up. We didn't need the church, right? So we fast forward a few years. I land this job in medical sales that would change the trajectory of, of our life. Uh, so I started making real money. I mean, something that I absolutely longed for and I thought if I can make money, all my problems uh, would, would be solved. So the money started coming in. I'd been given this opportunity, took complete advantage of it. I quadrupled my earnings and never looked back. I was the best sales rep this company had ever seen, competitive, uh, driven by money, driven by numbers. I hated losing. Um, you can imagine how quickly I became a monster uh, in this you know, how, how quickly I became a monster. And this, this really became my identity. So the money covered up our problems. Um, and then fast forward to 2008, we, we got married. Um, and after the honeymoon, the reality set in. You know, I was a terrible leader. I had no love for my wife, uh, no love for, for myself, um, or for anyone for that matter. You know, I was a boy trying to be a man, but absolutely had no idea. I was verbally abusive to her. I was controlling, I was demanding. I looked at my wife as, as an object and I had no respect for her. I began getting high again, began getting drunk again. And every night I would smoke weed until I fall, fell asleep. And it was to cover up my anxiety, to cover up my fear. I was, I was a mess. And so this went on my friends for five years. So on the brink of divorce, we decide having a child would heal everything would bring us closer. And on June 13th, 2012, my oldest son was born. It was the greatest day of my life. But that quickly faded and I fell right back into my sinful life. I told my wife I would stop getting high, I would change, and I didn't. I couldn't. I ended up losing my job, that job that produced this amazing income and all of this stuff. I lost that job, I got another job and lost that job. So now here it is, November 2012. My son is like five months old. I'm still living sinful, the sinful life. And I came home after losing that second job. Um, and, and my wife was like, we, we need to go to church this weekend. And this was the moment when the Lord used her to draw me to himself. So I went, we went, and I thought the church would literally catch on fire when I walked through the door. I mean, this is how... I mean, how I was just the devil. I mean, I was so sinful and just so ridiculous. Um, but I went in and it was the moment that the message was directed right at me. And you talk about when you, you read in the scriptures about the, the, the word is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, that, that sword of the, of, the, of the word split me wide open. And it was, it was, the message was about surrendering to Jesus. And I was struck by the Holy Spirit. And this was the beginning of the Lord drawing me to himself. And so over the next few months, the Lord continued to speak. And we went through the holidays and I did a lot of self-reflecting. And I decided to open a business at that point and stay home and say, you know what? I'm going to focus on my wife. I'm going to focus on my marriage. I'm going to focus on my children or my child. But that day changed my life forever. Or the day that changed my life forever was January 1, 
of 2013. And literally, I woke up in tears, broken, desperate, lost, tired, and I had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And it was this, as if he was in the room with me, extending his hand out, saying to me, son, I died for you. I died so that you could live a life of abundance and a, and the, and a purpose and, and the, the plans that I have for you. I've created you with a purpose. If you would just trust me and you would surrender your life and lay it down, I will take your life and I will take your brokenness and I will take your sin and I will take your mess and I will change it. And this was the moment that I went from broken to chosen. And so as, as men, you know, we, we, are, we are broken by this bondage of sin. We're, we're broken by this world. But see, God saves us. God saved me so that we can be chosen by him to do immeasurably more. And so it was this redemption that absolutely radically changed my life. And when I say my life, I mean every aspect of it. From, from, from me as a man to my marriage, to the way that I father, the way I lead, the way I handle my possessions, the way I serve, the way I give, my whole entire outlook on this life, the way I do life with people, and it was the Lord stripping me of the gods in my life and that had prevented me from fully experiencing him. So, you know, it, 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 was, it was fully experiencing him and, 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 and it was a, a process. I mean, you, we ask ourselves, does this, does this just happen overnight? Absolutely not. It's taken me nine years to get to this point. But but the great refiner, Jesus is the great refiner. He continues to prune my heart and he continues to cut away the junk that has absolutely plagued me. And I've continued this journey abiding in him. I always say abiding in this word. Without this, apart from Christ, he said you can do nothing. And so abiding in him, listening to the prompting of the Holy Spirit and allowing him to lead and guide and direct every step in my life and what he's produced is a changed man to lead, guide, and direct uh, my family, to lead, guide, and direct others and be an influencer for him. And I'm now a man that, that, that lives with, with purpose and lives with love and lives with patience and, and humility. Not every day, but I, I'm working on that. But he's, he's stripping me of my pride and he's showing me that the areas that I need to change. Am I perfect at these? Absolutely not. But it's, again, daily abiding that's helping me to climb this ladder of sanctification, as, as Jeremiah mentioned earlier. And this is the true pursuit of holiness, which only comes by his grace over every single aspect of our life. And so I've gone from broken to chosen. And, and, and the, the scripture that, that is the, the, the absolute foundation or central theme of, of my, this ministry that the Lord has given me is 1 Peter 2.9, which says, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who have called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. My friends, I, I came out of darkness. It's evident as you hear my story that I came from that to what you see now speaking into this camera. I've been called out of darkness and into his light for what? For, for, for to be an ambassador for Christ to be a, mess uh, a messenger of, of reconciliation and restoration. I mean, Jesus saved my marriage. He saved my kids. He saved my life. My friends, I deserve poverty. I deserve sickness. I, I, deserve, I deserve divorce. I deserve death. But he took that and he has given me fullness. He's given me health. He's given me a marriage that is thriving. And he's given me life in abundance. Does it mean we don't suffer? We don't face trials? No, it's the opposite. The theme of this, of this book is, of this New Testament is suffering. Our life since we've started seriously following Jesus has been challenging, but I, I wouldn't give up anything. I wouldn't give up, I wouldn't give up Jesus for any of this, any of this stuff, right? I'm going to, I will die for him. I, I'm going to exhaust my life for him and my family follow suit. And so this leads to the next and the final uh, uh, part of this talk. Jesus made me a real man. And then we all ask this million dollar question. Well, 
what is a real man? I mean, I think all of us ask this question. And I know how I have for many years. But the Lord has shown me, and I truly want to continue to share my story in hopes to point people to Jesus and to wake men up, to rise up. My friends, we have a major calling. And I want to point out to you, and I want you to just listen to these words. We will all stand eyeball to eyeball with Jesus one day soon. So stop and just take a minute. Just just take a few seconds to reflect that you are now, close your eyes and, and picture yourself standing eyeball to eyeball with Jesus. And the first thing he may ask us is, how did you do leading your family? How, how did you do loving your wife? Friends, our wives and our children will stand before the King of Kings, the holy God of the universe, and they will answer to Jesus. And my friends, we are responsible for that. We are the head of our wives and kids, just as Jesus is the head of of the bride. We are to mimic Jesus. I mean, have you ever thought about what mimicking Jesus even means? I mean, we can save that for another talk, but I think you guys are following me. It's a real serious responsibility and it has eternal implications. So the issue is many young boys are being raised to think that males are somehow created uh, to dominate everything. It's our purpose from birth. You know, we watch our dad show us how real men lead sexual conquest, athletic prowess, no sensitivity, no feelings. Guys, we don't feel we do. We beat our chest. You know, we let the world know who we are. We drink cold beer and we drink protein shakes and we hit the gym and we pump weights and we, we, you know, we, we, we think it's all about image. It's all about status. We obsess over sports and we idolize sports entertainment. Well, especially in this country. We base our leadership success on how much money we make, how much we provide for our families. We lay on the couch and we, we flip around the remote control demanding our wives to serve us, serve the kids and expect this to produce something good. You know what this narrative produces? The, the narrative that, 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 uh, that, of, 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 that produces men who, who think that with brute force and violence and, and misogyny and, and masculinity, when men embrace this narrative, you know what you get? You get men like Harvey Weinstein. You get men like Jeffrey Epstein. And I know that's extreme, but, but that's essentially what you get. And, and this is what the narrative is in our country. I'm entitled, it's mine, violent brute force. I take what I want, I get what I want, I'm a man. This is a lie and it's from hell and it's demonic. And our daughters and our sisters all over the world are bearing the violence of this. So this is a state of manhood, especially in America. This is why we have the problems we have. Essentially, we have a bunch of boys who think they're men and what we have are boys leading homes when they have no idea how to lead at all because they fail to submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. So surrender, submission, oh, not me. I mean, I, I, we wouldn't be caught dead saying those words. That's not what real men do. So what happens is men feed off of what society is giving them, what the enemy is feeding them, rather than following God's design. And the result, look around. It's not hard to see that being a man is destroying, being the man is destroying our world. So one thing I want to make very clear is Satan, the enemy, is prowling around looking to kill and devour, and he hates two things. He hates a righteous man, a man that pursues God, pursues righteousness, pursues upright life, a life of surrender, a life of humility. He hates that. Second thing he hates is he hates masculinity. And so we ask ourselves, what is true masculinity? Well, I don't think any of us can even define this anymore because the world has so perverted the idea of what it means to be a man. It seems the second... False narrative is working based on the landscape. So look at what Satan attacks. And I'm going to get to the end of this. He attacks the home. He attacks the family. He attacks marriage. He loves to bring divide. His goal is to get the man out. And he knows if there's no man in the house, that goes against God's uh, intention for the family. So why do you think there's the push for feminism? I mean, look at what we see on TV now. Look at the commercials. Look at the secular music. All of it's designed to lull you to sleep and program your mind to accept this message. That is not godly. So let me ask you guys this. What does it mean to be a a man in biblical terms? And let's just see what the scriptures say about what it means to be a man. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14 states it perfectly. Be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. 
be courageous, be strong, and do everything with love. So what is Paul saying here to you, men, to me, men, me? (laughs) Paul is, is putting all the commands around this imperative to act like a man. So what does it look like to be more than a male, a man? First, he said, be on guard. Pay attention. Don't be silly. Uh, uh, don't, uh, don't act like a, a fool. Be serious. I'm not saying you got to be crusty and grumpy. As men, we're ambassadors of fun. You know, we're ambassadors of joy. I'm just saying, don't be silly. And you know how I define silly? My eight and four year old boys, they're silly. They're insane. Anybody who has young children, young boys especially, you know what I mean. I love them, but I'm not about to put them in a a position to lead or a position to build or or execute anything. Men aren't silly. They're serious. They're full of life. They're full of joy, but real men know where they are going and they understand the stakes that exist in their home and in the world. Second, stand firm in the faith. This one is the one is the most important. Paul's not saying stand firm in your discipline or your abilities or your or your will. No, he's saying you stand firm in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Why? Because we are either prone to shame or, pro, or or arrogance. If we fall, here comes the shame. If we succeed, we beat our chest. Guys, Jesus, him alone, his work alone is what we stand on. When we do this, we are grounded and we give Satan no foothold. I mean, how many of us have bought this? This, uh, this lie that strength, not being soft, not being weak, not struggling is somehow masculine. Guys, when we stand firm in the faith, we have strength to own our weakness. We admit our neediness. And here's the truth. When we have been so programmed to fight failure with one of two things, withdrawal and aggression. Who suffers when that happens? It's usually our wife, usually our kids. Third, be strong and courageous. And I'm wrapping it up. I know my time is short. What does it mean to be strong and courageous? Guys, keep leaning into Jesus. Keep trusting in Jesus. Keep getting back up. Keep believing in his grace. And and when you do this, you will reflect the gospel if you're able to stand strong in Jesus. If you're able to be courageous enough in your own failure and you can admit your weakness, that is reflecting Christ, is reflecting the glory and his, his power over you. Lastly, do everything with love. Guys, the motivating force of biblical masculinity is love. Think about how different this is than this macho worldly man message. This is radically different. The motivating force of biblical masculinity is not physical strength. Guys, it's not what kind of job you have. It's not your bank account. It's not how far you can throw a football. It's not how scary you are when you get mad. It's not your hobbies. It's love. This is what makes the engine run. And we have it twisted. And this is the lie that we've been allowing the enemy to tell us. And we have been believing it. Guys, our, 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 our world is suffering. And I believe it's suffering because of us. Because we fail to own our roles. And I'm telling you today that you owe your wife. You owe your kids. You owe your family something. You need to open this book on the daily. On the daily. And see what God says about being a man. And what does he say? Guys, I'm going to leave you with nine striking bullet points to meditate on right now. God says a real man commits to following a greater authority. And you know who that is? It's Jesus. A real man commits to sacrifice, to sacrifice all else in the shadow of discipleship. Are you currently being discipled? Are you making disciples? Are you a disciple of Jesus? A real man commits to determined, joyful obedience to Christ. Guys, we must obey Jesus. A real man commits to spiritual discipline. A real man commits to abide in the word of truth, which is the scriptures. A real man commits to growth and production, especially spiritual fruit. Guys, if you're not reflecting self-control and love and patience and kindness and peace and all this, you're, you're missing the mark. A real man commits to carry out God's mission. What is his mission? Guys, we gotta open the book and look. A real man commits to love others faithfully. And lastly, a real man commits to brotherhood and community. My friends, I fail at all of these daily, but I'm recognizing it and doing something about it. And I'm asking you guys to do the same. So what do we do? Guys, we gotta stop talking and we gotta start doing. We must kill our pride and start applying this teaching to our lives. And if we wanna be world changers, my friends, it's it's gonna, it's gonna take 
being a real man. So my friends, that's all I have for you. I didn't even look and see if anybody had questions. I'm so sorry if I messed up on the, um, the webinar thing and maybe half the people didn't hear it. I hope they did, but uh, Jeremiah, I appreciate your time. I, I don't know from here, I'm willing to jump off or step down or answer questions or whatever. Thank you, Jeremiah. Thank you all for listening. And I'm going to hang out and listen to the next. So appreciate you guys. I guess I'm going to just end this call. See you guys. What up, guys? Come on now. So yeah, so just so you guys know the, the context behind this. So I got invited through Instagram uh, through a guy out in California or something. And he had asked me if I would speak on being broken to chosen. Thank you so much, guys. I thank you so much. I got to record this and share it later. Um, but, uh, but he had asked me to be a part of this. And man, I heard, when I heard, what's your story, share it, and then tell men what they need to do. And I know some of there, there are some women on here. Um, yeah, no, no, thank you, Rihanna. You know what though, but for, this is what I wanna to say to the, to the females on this call. Guys, that's the man you should be looking for. It's not just for men, okay? Men, you heard what I said if you were hanging out and, and you've heard the expectation has been set. But for you women, you young women who may not have relationships and you, like Rihanna, you're a young, young, young girl. And I know one day you will, you know, you will settle down and find somebody and they're, for those out there that are looking for a man that are not ready to be with a man, those who may be married and listening to this, guys, this is the expectation. This is the standard. And it's Christ. Christ has shown us. He's shown men how they're called to, to, to lead. He's shown women the standard of, of the man that they should be looking for. So you need to be looking for that, guys. So thank you all. I love you so much. James, I still owe you a call. And I'm going to hit you back. Okay, I'm going to hit you up when I get off of here. Um, guys, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, Javon, thank you if you're still here. Love you all so much. Thank you for hanging out. What's up, Samuel? I don't know if he's still here. Probably not. Maybe he left, but um, love you, bro. All right, guys, I'm going to jump off here and share this right now.